Hello and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm your host, Chris Collins. The legislative session on Beacon Hill is about to end. I believe the end of July is when it ends. And then we get in the middle of uh, election season. Here to talk about some issues in front of the legislature currently is my good friend, Representative of the 2nd Hampshire District, John Sybeck. Hi, Represents East Hampton, Hadley, South Hadley, and half of Granby. That's correct. You got that right? Okay, you do. good. Uh, I've interviewed John many times on the radio. John's a, a friend of mine from, from years past. In fact, I believe we helped you get elected in, in your first writing, your first sticker campaign. Absolutely, you yeah. guys did. And uh, it was back when Dennis Lee and I were hosting the WHMP Morning News together. And I've interviewed John for years off and on. And he's one of my favorite people to talk Beacon Hill politics with because you're always in the middle of a lot of really interesting pieces of legislation. I want to start off, though, from the top. Uh, with one that we talked about recently that I don't think many people know about, and that's this telemarketing reform bill. Mm -hmm. uh, you're the chair of the Labor and Workforce Development Committee. Uh, talk about this telemarketing reform thing. What is it? We had a bill last term when I was chairing consumer protection and professional licensure dealing with, with this whole issue. You know, how many, I don't think there's anyone watching who has not gotten the calls around dinner time. The person calls and, and you know what it's about. Uh, you're frustrated, you never know who exactly is calling, who they're working for, they've interrupted you. Uh, you get so frustrated, you look at your caller ID and either the number's blocked, or if the number is there, you try that number and it says, sorry, number not... Yeah, number un unavailable, right. or, or it's some bizarre 800 number you never heard of, or in That's some right. cases, it's, it's, you know, you're calling from Seattle, Washington, or Los Angeles, California, or it, it, do it doesn't say what the company is, and it's maddening. That's right. So, so what this bill does is require telemarketers to identify themselves within the first minute in terms of who they're working for, uh, and also to provide you on the caller ID a valid number that you can call. So people are frustrated because apparently the, the do not call list doesn't work as, as effectively. Uh, and, and you have a right, I believe, to, um, to respond and to, to be able to, to get answers to those questions. So it was really filed by a constituent, uh, our friend of uh, Rep. Gail Caridi out of, out of North Adams. It's a bill that I thought was going to go through last term. Uh, it's, it's got some legs this term because I think people just recognizing enough is enough. What held it up last time? Was there significant pushback from the industry or was it just one of those things that got bogged down? Bureaucracy? I think it's one of the things that got bogged down and, and there were some changes that the committee made this time. Uh, and people you know, don't realize, you know, when you have 7,000 bills filed yeah. and you get down to this last month or two, it really sometimes is a matter of, of, of priorities. Uh, and sometimes people also forget that, that we don't really end on July 31st, we end formal sessions. So if you really want to bird dog and really push in a bill, there are still bills that will be passing in August, September, right through December. Uh, and, and so this is one that, that I'm very confident we're going to get through. Uh, the House, and, and I see no reason why the Senate and the governor wouldn't sign it as well. But let's be clear, this does not prevent telemarketers from calling. It just changes the rules under which they operate. And also, I, I, my understanding is you can't call purporting to be from an agency like a police or a fire department Correct. soliciting funds. You need to really be honest, and, and, and uh, there are also provisions in terms of the attorney general uh, cracking down as well. So if somebody isn't following the rules, uh, there's the possibility of, uh, of seeing action taken as opposed to just having a frustrated consumer. But don't they also have to have their scripts approved and, and, and be able to be audited, right? Yes, by, they have to provide those scripts, exactly. And is the AG going to be willing to be that, I guess, is it going to follow up? Or is it going to be one of these things where it's sort of, you know, we say this is on the books, but we're not really going to enforce it? No, I, I think they are. And I think the question is going to be, you know, if you get one call from, you know, the, the Center for the Advancement of... Um, uh, name the cause, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. What, name calling, let's say. Yeah. Uh, then they may not do that. But if you start seeing organizations that are doing it a number of times, uh, repeatedly, or getting a number of complaints, then I think um, they will follow up. And, and the, the fines are pretty substantial. So if, if you're doing this and doing it to a, a large number of consumers, uh, the fines can, can really add up. Well, recently there was an especially heinous report of a, of a local person who was making calls to raise money for the family of this Auburn cop that got killed. Mm -hmm. And it was a complete sham. I mean, those kinds of things, I mean, to be able to stop that, I think, is very beneficial. I agree. I agree. Now, you also said that when you were a South Hadley selectman, before you became a rep, you got a call from somebody purporting to be a South Hadley police officer doing a fundraising call. And you caught up, right? Because they, right. they weren't part of the department because you knew everybody. No, I, well, not only that, but I asked, you know, a second time saying, what would you say your name was? 
And he repeated. And I said, and you said you're a South Hadley police officer. And, and in my role as, as, as being a selectman, I was actually one of the police commissioners. So I knew the 28 sworn officers and said, you, you, know, you are not one of the officers on the South Hadley police force. And all of a sudden, the number went click. Yeah, exactly. Terrible. Well, that's great. I think that that's fantastic that, that this is even being considered another new bill that you're involved with. And this is, this is going to be a big one because this deals with business non-competes. And I just learned about this, but mm -hmm. give us the bottom line on this particular piece of legislation. Well, we've got a situation where there are a lot of individuals who work for companies and they're asked to, fi to sign a, a non-competition agreement, which essentially says, if you leave this business, you cannot go work for one of our competitors. Um, the problems are that in many cases, uh, there are a number of problems. In many cases, the employee doesn't get the non-compete till the first day that they're on the job. You show up for work the first day, the person says, well, here's the, the form you need to sign to, to, you know, for, for the, the IRS in terms of tax deductions. Here's the papers you work you need to sign for your health insurance. And here's a non-compete you have to sign. Well, at that point, it's, it's a little late. You've already resigned your last position. Yeah. You kind of are over a barrel and either have to sign it or not sign it. Um, so that's, that's one issue in terms of notice. A second issue is sometimes these situations are carried out where the, uh, the action, if you, if you choose to take it, is in the corporate, uh, the office of the corporate headquarters or, or that state. So for example, you know, in Northampton, we've got the Coca-Cola bottling company. Yes. And I'm not picking on them, but just it's one of the first examples. So if for some reason an employee for Coca-Cola decides they want to contest this, Coca-Cola could say, well, we're going to do it in Atlanta. And now the employee who's living in Northampton would have to commute to Atlanta, have to hire an attorney in Atlanta. So there's a lot of things that, where the deck seems to be stacked in favor of the employer and not the employee. Uh, California is the one state that does not uh, enforce non-competes. Businesses seem to succeed there uh, very, very well. Uh, and interestingly, when this started, I thought that there would be objections from uh, entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists. They're the ones who say, why don't we get a total ban? Just eliminate them altogether. Really? Um, and so what we've come up with is what we think is a reasonable compromise. We're not going to ban uh, non-competes, but the bill that we reported out said you can have a non-compete up to a year. Uh, you, there's a garden leave clause so that you would actually pay the employee 50% of their salary this during the half period. half the money that they would Half the money that we would be paying them. Interesting. Um, and the, the most, one of the most important things is something that if you took it to court, under our current situation, the, the judge can, can amend it, saying, well, this is unduly restrictive. You could have a non-compete that says, uh, Chris Collins, you are not going to be allowed to work in any of the 50 states uh, for the next five years. And the judge could say, well, it's unreasonable, so we'll say you can't work in Massachusetts and Rhode Island for the next year. Uh, so what we're proposing is that it's really the roll of the dice that the judge does not have the authority to change it. He will either say or she will say, this is unduly restrictive and will we'll basically throw it out of court or allow it to be enforced. I would think big companies would be terrified of this idea and would probably lobby strongly against it. Some, some of them are, uh, but there are big companies. Google uh, does not use non-competes. Uh, General Electric that just moved to Massachusetts uses some in some cases. Uh, what's happened up to this point is most of the non-competes have been boilerplate. So what we're trying to move toward is a situation where the, the non-compete agreement is really tailored to the employee. Uh, we also already have on the books, there are certain other provisions. So you are not allowed to disclose trade secrets. Mm -hmm. You can't solicit uh, your former customers. You can't uh, disclose other information. So we, we think it's just a fair way to protect both business, but also protect the employee. I would think progressives in the legislature would love this idea because it does sort of give a protection to the people rather than the, the big multinational corporations that benefit from this. It does, but, but I think there are, there are, you know, there's some corporations that really deserve to, to have some protection. You know, um, for example, if, if you worked for a pharmaceutical company and spent the last 10 years working on an anti-Alzheimer's drug, you now go to work for a competitive company, uh, one of the competitors, you can say, well, I wouldn't go down this road or that road. We tried that for five years. That, that's a dead end. That information is so valuable uh, so it really would give a competitive advantage to company number two. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, too, Hazen Paper in, in Holyoke produces the Super Bowl program every year. I did know that. A and on the cover, there's a hologram. It is, it is unique. It is certainly proprietary. So Hazen Paper you know, has a legitimate reason why an employee wouldn't leave and then go to another paper company and say, oh, here's how you do the hologram. Uh, so I think they're, they're, they're a value 
Uh, there are values that are at stake. I think there's, there's a rationale at stake for both the companies as well as for the employees. I just want to have it to be a more level playing field. It would seem to me that a bill like that with all the potential scenarios you just mentioned and, and, and the various companies that will be affected in different ways, it must be a tremendously intricate bill to write. Is it not? It, it is. Uh, I had some great staff who, who, who really worked on it. The speaker announced in March at, the, uh, at a speech before the Boston Chamber of Commerce we were doing this bill. Um, I've had tremendous input from people on both sides, uh, both pro and, and con. Uh, I've met with some of the, the, the foremost experts in, in the field, and it's, it's really kind of fun that you're doing something that, that really could potentially be a landmark piece of legislation, not just for Massachusetts, but as a model for the rest of the country. And a piece that's flying pretty much under the radar. This is the first I've heard of yes. it, and I, and I follow Big Hill pretty quick, closely. So now that the cat's out of the bag, do you expect there to be more pushback, or do you think this is, and can this get done this term? No, I expect that this bill is going to come up in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, the speaker and I were talking about it just uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, his staff and I are, uh, and my staff are ready. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see this coming up in the next couple of weeks. What do you think the governor is on this? I mean, he's, he's a friend of corporations, too. I mean, do you, do you think that he'll put up resistance? Will he veto, do you think? Or? I, I, I think, you know, he, he's proven to be uh, a reasonable person. Uh, and, and I think there, there are some merits. Now, you know, like any other bill, this bill's going to come on the floor. Um, there could be any number of amendments. The bill could change dramatically. Um, the governor could, could also make some changes, but I think we're going to do something one way or the other. What about the Senate? Have you talked to the, the Senate president or anybody on that side? I've talked to the Senate president, uh, Senator Dan Wolf, who was my co-chair, and was really on board with this. Uh, so I think we can... Uh, Will Brownsberger, the senator from Belmont, has, has always been a strong advocate. Um, the, on our side, Lori Ehrlich, the, the rep from Marlboro, has been pushing for this for a couple of sessions. So although it's been under the radar, this has been in the works for a couple of sessions, and I think it is time to do it, and we will. All right. We look forward to seeing the debate on that, and then that, that would be a landmark legislation if you can get it passed. Another piece of landmark legislation that did get passed and signed into law was the public records reform line. Mm-hmm. We've talked about this on the radio, but I want to talk about it on TV because I think this is something that's been 40 years in the making, and it was a, in a difficult needle to thread, and Peter Kokot did a lot of work on it, you did a lot of work on it. Um, what are the, the basic tenets of this reform bill? It's very simple. It, it, it's the fact that people, general public, when they want access to information, they should be able to get it without having to jump through a number of hoops, incurring uh, ex- tremendous expense, or, or waiting for months, or in some cases even years, to get access to information that, that truly has been deemed public, uh, public information. The problem is, particularly for us out here in Western Massachusetts, is you're talking in some cases very small towns, yeah. towns where, where town clerk's offices are only open several days a week, uh, if at all, and sometimes part, part-time. So we have to come up and, and strike a balance, and, and, and Peter Kokot, who really championed this, did a tremendous job. Uh, he's got the support of the Mass Municipal Association, has the support of people like Common Cause. So both sides looked at this bill and said it truly is a, uh, an improvement over where we were. People should be able to get access to the information they need without being charged outrageous sums, uh, without being hamstrung in terms of getting access to it. So it's, I think it, it will help um, increase transparency for, for all the citizens of the Commonwealth. And uh, again, like, like the other bill, I think it'll uh, be seen by particularly people in small communities uh, across this country as a landmark piece of legislation. I think that in small towns there is a a significant challenge. You mentioned the hours of, of, of operation, and a lot of these clerk, clerks are part-time clerks. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that's occurred recently with the change in the rules regarding public information and, 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 and public uh, meeting minutes and that kind of thing is you've had people who have had gripes against communities use that almost as a cudgel against the town by basically demanding minutes from meetings that sometimes take two or three weeks to process, mm-hmm. and then you wind up with the town being hit with a judgment by the state for violating that law. Does this, does this reform law address that at all? It does, and, and it's, it's ensuring that individuals can't use this in a retaliatory fashion, that, that you, you just can't go in and, and ask for every, every public document. I want the minutes of every meeting for the last 20 years with, from the, you know, X community select board or, or planning board. Um, so it, it recognizes there is an obligation to, to provide the information, but also there's an obligation to be reasonable and not place an undue burden on communities. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I, and I think that's important. And also, what this bill, as I understand it, also 
encourages towns to start putting a lot of these records online or essentially to ele make electric files, electronic files of them rather than having everything be on paper, which I think is a good, a good upgrade. Absolutely. You know, I, I think that's, that's an important piece. You know, it, it also relates to another bill that I've filed in terms of public posting of, uh, of jobs that I know the Hampshire Gazette picked up on uh, quite a while ago. And, and it used to be that people did not want to uh, uh, post them because they said, we, you know, we can't post every job in the Commonwealth. It's going to cost too much money because they used to publish this, I remember. this, this yeah, yeah. Uh, report every couple of weeks that almost looked like a phone book and said, well, you know, it's going to be too expensive. Well, now that it's online, you know, why not post? With, with certain exceptions. I know you're not going to post cabinet positions. I know you're not going to post positions where collective bargaining says that, that the internal candidates you know, have, have um, the right to bid on that job first. But there's no logical reason why a position that's available and is scheduled to be filled by some agency in the Commonwealth or a municipality isn't posted. The only tough part about the online thing, and I agree with you, I mean, it, it's time now to get into the 21st century in terms of electronic records, but you still have some towns that don't have access to high-speed internet. And I know that that's not a thing that's necessarily on your plate. You know, MBI is working on that and, and trying to get that last spot completed, but that is an impediment that small communities deal with every day. It is, but I think, I think having this legislation and having this possibility closed out for 40 some odd communities in the Commonwealth may provide the impetus to get that last mile done. I hope so. I mean, I hope something provides the impetus because they're, they're still arguing over bits and pieces and who pays for what. And it just, it's, it's an economic disadvantage to small communities. And I know you represent some small towns, mm -hmm. but you also represent some bigger towns that have this service. So it's not as m a big of a deal in your district, but in a district like Steve Kulix, I mean, mm -hmm. even in some of the hill towns here in, in the frontier, area. There's still areas where you can't get high-speed service and you can't be competitive if you don't have that, uh, access to that kind of well, stuff. Well, plus we have, we have lots of people who depend on that for their livelihood. Right. Pe extremely creative people who would love to live here in western Massachusetts because of the quality of life but say, I just can't afford to because I don't have the internet access. You know, I work out of my home. The internet is, is my lifeline. That's how I do my job. So as a result, we're losing opportunities for, for people to come here who can contribute to our creative economy, who can contribute significant uh, tax dollars in terms of income taxes and various things. Once we're, we, we get over that, uh, that hurdle, I think it can certainly open things tremendously for us in terms of our economy. Absolutely. And, and it, it would be a game changer for the small communities. Imagine if you could run a internet software producer out of your house if mm -hmm. you had the, the technology and you had high speed and you could live in the hills of Conway, you could live in the hills of, of whatever small town out here, it'd, it'd be great. You'd have people coming out here left and right. So hopefully that'll get done. My understanding is, uh, turning to the budget for a second, is that we have less money than we thought. Tax yes. receipts were off. Yep. Uh, the last number I heard was three quarters of a billion maybe. Was that, is that wrong? Three quarters of a million. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're three quarters of a billion. We're, I've heard the numbers could be anywhere from 300 million to 750 okay, million. Okay, that, that was the high mark, 750 uh, million. Is that accurate? And what happens at that point? I mean, can the legislature cut that kind of money? Well, what we're talking about is really looking at a gap in, in the FY17 budget. So yeah. it's not like we're, we need to do this in the next couple of weeks. So what's happening right now is, is the, the six member conference committee that's looking at the FY17 budget which includes Steve Kulik yep. and, and also um, Todd Smola from Western Mass, uh, are looking at that and, and scrutinizing, do we need to cut back in terms of some of the things that heretofore might have been included in the FY17 budget? Um, that's number one. Number two, what do we do going forward? And, and is it a situation where we, we may need to hold back on some things? For example, would, would the, uh, the governor and, and the administration not uh, issue some RFPs for some potential grant dollars. Do we hold back on that? Do we, uh, you know, and, and I don't know what they're talking about, but, but there are things, you know, like community development block grants, CDBG grants. Do we, um, do, we do something in, in terms of maybe advancing and pushing forward some of our economic um, impetus, the economic development stuff that we're going to be debating in the next couple of weeks? Yeah. So how do we handle that? And making sure that we're watching very closely as, as we end FY16 and start FY17 to see where the revenue is. So we had projected somewhere in the neighborhood of like 4.4%, I think it was. Uh, people saying it could be as low as 2.8 to 3%. So let's see what happens in terms of those benchmarks. And if, if things go back to where we expected, you know, what I would anticipate is a supplemental budget would come 
uh, or several of them would come out trying to restore some of the cuts that were that were made. But I think local aid would be held harmless, Absolutely. and so would Chapter 70. That's, yes. Those are commitments that all three of the big three, the House Speaker, the Senate President, yes. and the Governor have all agreed on. So. Absolutely. But the other problem is, is when you hold harmless local aid, Chapter 70 in terms of education funding, um, and recognize that there are some, so many other line items that, that are mandatory, you know, bond, uh, obligations, uh, retiree funding, those sorts of things, the amount of discretionary income shrinks. And so it is not going to be a painless process. Uh, but again, as the governor said, I'd rather face this now than face it in November and December and try to make up this sort of a shortfall in a six month period. Speaking of potential financial disasters, um, I want to talk about OPEB for a minute. And mm -hmm. this is the, yep. this is the responsibility of, for retiree benefits that at some point it's going to get shifted back on the towns. The state's been handling it. And I think that there are towns trying to put money aside for it, but realistically, this could be a huge amount of money towns are going to be on the hook for. Should towns be worried? Should they be planning for this right now? Or is this something that is not going to be anything to worry about right away? But, no, towns definitely should be worrying about it. What, what's happened over the last couple of years is, is there was um, GASB in terms of general accounting practices yeah. requiring towns to, to start indicating where their shortfalls were. So, so some towns are just cruising along and not even having residents or people member of the finance committee understand how their shortfalls. So now that we're recognizing where they are and how large they are, uh, some communities are putting far more money into it. Uh, and I think that's an important piece to, to ensure that, that we are protecting uh, the, the retirement funds uh, for, for the employees. And people often complain and say, you know, we should not have, we shouldn't have our, our state retirement system. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that doesn't make a lot of sense for a couple of reasons. Number one, Massachusetts is a non-social security state. Yeah. So we are not, the Commonwealth is not using any tax dollars of residents to pay into social security. The, the last numbers that I saw when I was chair of public service was that the cost to the Commonwealth for uh, pensions for state employees was about 2.8%, as opposed to the 5.95% in terms of social security and those numbers. So it's, it's far less um, than it would be. Uh, and, and so I think, I think the system works. Uh, the actuarial data is showing that our new state employees, the, the ones who've been hired in the last five years, are going to pay in somewhere between 104 and 106 percent of what they ever would expect to get out of, out, out of pensions. Um, I think the third piece is looking across the Commonwealth, looking at municipalities and, and, and county retirement boards and seeing what their return on investment was. Governor Patrick talked about doing this, and if you were an underperforming retirement board, then at some point the state would take over. And, and, and the state for the last 30 years had been somewhere in the you know, 8 to 9 percent return on investment. There are some communities and some counties where the return on investment was 4 percent. So you're seeing your, your, your obligation build and, and you can't keep up. And so, so in essence the difference between community A at 4 percent and the state at 8 percent is dramatic. If the state took it over you would have far more money to be able to look at things like roads and, and, and education and other things. So it's, it's something we have to tackle. Um, the fortunate thing is we're not as bad off as some other states. I mean, the state of Illinois is in horrific shape. Didn't it uh, almost Michigan. bankrupt Michigan too? Or there was a, yeah, there was a couple. There were some issues there, yeah. and, and uh, Michigan, for example, started taxing pensions, uh, which which they had not done before. Um, that's and that's another difference. Massachusetts is it's viewed as a contractual obligation, so we can't change the pension uh, obligations that we have for employees once they start. Um, it, it, the Constitution says it is a guaranteed benefit. Um, so some of the suggestions people say, well, why don't we just cut the pensions in half or, or, or reduce it? And you start looking at some of these people who are particularly our seniors right now who, whose pensions are, were very, very low. I mean, the salaries were low. Think right. about people who were working in the 60s and the 70s, uh, and they're living on far less than some people would be making on Social Security. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And the concern I think I have and the, the, the town officials have is that one day the state's just going to say, we're out of the pension business and it's up to you to fix it and, and fund it. And you're talking about hundreds of million do dollars in towns that have, you know, $40 million budgets and it's just not practical. You know, I, I, I've seen what happened in other states and, and I can think of a town in Alabama, um, New York Times did a story on it and they said, if you don't start putting more money in, your, your pension system is going to be bankrupt in five years. They didn't heed the warnings. Five years, they said to the retirees and, and, and Alabama, I believe it was Alabama, and they were also a non-Social Security state. They said, your next pension check is your last one. 
So in that community, the chief of police is now the head of security at Walmart. (laughs) The head of the DPW is living off uh, proceeds of a tip jar at the local diner. I mean, these people went from having a pension that they thought would, would save them for the rest of their lives to absolutely nothing. Right, and defeats the whole purpose of having the pension system. The whole idea was to save something so when you retired, you'd be all right. Exactly. So the insolvency sometimes is very frightening, especially if if you're approaching that age. One final thing, uh, you come from the land of healthcare. You were a healthcare administrator before Mm -hmm. you became a state rep, and I know that there's some efforts to try and reform the dental health part of the healthcare reform bill. One in 10 Massachusetts residents still does not have adequate dental coverage. What do you know about that, and is there an effort underway to fix that? There is, and there, there, there are several strategies. I mean, it used to be that uh, if a dentist took Mass Health and they took one patient with Mass Health, they had to take everyone. Right. And so the end result was that the dentist saying, I'm not taking Mass Health. I, I'm losing money on every one of these patients, and I just can't afford to have my practice be entirely Mass Health. So we changed that a few years ago to allow them to do it, but, but in, a, in a controlled fashion. Um, that being said, there are still are individuals on Mass Health who, who can't find a dentist, and, right. and it certainly is an issue out here in Western Massachusetts. And they're going to the uh, ER. And, and they're going to the ER. Uh, so if they're on Mass Health and, and they can't find a dentist, they are going to the ER because of toothaches, or you know, a simple dental procedure turns into an abscess. I, I can remember one case of a woman in Springfield. Terrible. They tried to find a dentist, they couldn't. She ultimately wound up in the ICU for a week. And we all paid for it uh, as a result. So there's a bill that was for, uh, presented by Representative Pignatelli of, of Berkshire County and Senator Harriet Chandler to allow dental hygienists to do some basic dental procedures uh, in, in terms of fillings and, and perhaps extractions. There's a lot of pushback from the Dental Society. I bet. Uh, and so Senator Chandler said, I'm happy to withdraw my bill if all you dentists agree to start treating these patients. Oh. Um, and, and so it's... It's at least uh, providing a basis for some discussion. Um, we had covered adult dental uh, for a while in, in the budget. With budget cuts, we, we lost it for a while, and, and I think it's something we absolutely have to address because people don't realize that oral health problems contribute to overall health. I mean, it can, you, you, the complications of bad uh, dental health are you know, cardiac conditions, diabetes, and we can go on and on with the list. Uh, all of which are going to cost us far more in the long run. So it's like that, that old Fram oil filter, pay me now or pay me later. Yeah, exactly. This is one where I think we really need to pay it now. Well, I certainly hope that they're able to get it figured out. And it's, it's one of those few gaps in a healthcare reform system that most people think is, is not perfect, but it's pretty good, 98% coverage in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. So, John, I really appreciate you making the time. I know you, you're, uh, you're out and about in the district, and uh, it was, I'm very happy that you came to South Theater to talk to us, and thanks for coming in. Anytime, Chris. Anytime. John Seibach represents the 2nd Hampshire District in the state legislature. I'm Chris Collins. That's Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.